Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Turner with the Electrical and Computer Engineering Technologies Program at Purdue University in New Albany, Indiana, and you're watching a video lecture for ECET 273 Modern Energy Systems. Today's lecture is part one in a four-part series on the use of AC power. Many of the important technical characteristics of the modern electric power system have to do with their use of a technology known as alternating current, or AC. Although the acronym AC is technically an abbreviation of the phrase alternating current, it's very generally taken to represent any electrical system in which the flow of electric charge periodically reverses direction, and the term AC can therefore apply to both voltage and current, so it is okay to say things such as AC voltage and AC current. AC is the form in which the vast majority of electric power is delivered to businesses and residences worldwide. In this module, we're going to introduce the concept of alternating current systems, or AC systems. In previous courses, we've already dealt with direct current, or DC systems, in which the voltage polarity always remains the same, with the voltage potential always being positive on one side and negative on the other side, with current always flowing in the same direction. For example, as provided by a AA battery. So we've got some AA batteries here. These are 1.5 volt DC batteries. You can see we use this red arrow to indicate that the voltage level never changes. No matter when in time I measure the voltage level, it's constant. It's a direct voltage and therefore the current flow is always in one direction. We call that a DC system. In contrast, the polarity of the voltage and direction of current flow in AC systems reverses and oscillates very rapidly. The shape of the voltage and current are typically described by a sine or cosine waveform and are specified by the associated wave properties of amplitude, frequency, and phase. So we've got a sine or cosine function. Uh, to fully describe that, we have to know its amplitude, how big it is, frequency, and phase. For AC power systems in the United States, the AC frequency is 60 hertz, uh, 60 cycles per second, meaning that the direction of the voltage and current are reversed 60 times per second. The main advantage of the use of AC in the electric power system is the ease by which its voltage can be raised and lowered by the use of transformers. However, early electric power systems utilize DC. Although DC voltages can be stepped up and stepped down, this requires far more sophisticated and expensive equipment than was typically available uh, at the time when AC systems were first introduced. Uh, this limitation had significant ramifications during the early days of electrification. So in 1882, Thomas Edison began operation of the Pearl Street Steam Electric Plant, really the world's first uh, electrical plant. Um, and it was a DC distribution system. The Pearl Street Station served 85 customers uh, who collectively owned about 400 high resistance carbon filament incandescent light or incandescent lamps, excuse me. In these early days of electric power, electric lighting was really the only type of electric load a load being a device connected to the output of an electric circuit. Edison utilized constant DC voltage generators connected in parallel that served radial circuits with an incandescent lamps that were also connected in parallel. Uh, these generators here, they were connected in parallel to supply the needed current and these lamps here were connected in parallel such that the same potential difference or voltage was seen by each of the lamps in the systems. These lights were designed to operate at about 110 volts DC and the reason that voltage was chosen was because given the materials that the lamps were made out of, this delivered a lighting performance similar to the gas lamps of the time and also represented a relatively low risk of shock to customers. So 110 volts DC uh, wasn't particularly life-threatening to customers. 110 volt DC generators were designed to serve the load and were chosen as a consequence of the economics related to the diameter of the copper wires needed to connect the generators to lamps located up to several kilometers away. As a simple approximation, the lamps utilized in Edison's distribution system, so these lamps, as a simple approximation, can be modeled effectively as just resistors, uh, meaning that the ratio of the voltage across the lamp to the current through the lamp is a constant. So these things can be modeled by uh, R equals V over I. The ratio of the voltage across the lamp to the current through the lamp is just given by R. And we know that's measured in uh, ohms. 
So each of these lamps just looks like a resistor. In essence, an incandescent bulb can be analyzed as just a resistor with a value measured in ohms in which electric energy is converted into heat or light. Often this relationship is stated as Ohm's law, V equals IR. And calculating the power consumed by an incandescent bulb can be done by using the formula for power absorbed by a resistor from a circuit. Uh, the power or rate at which energy is converted or consumed by the DC resistive load is given by power equals current times voltage, or P equals IV. In this case, power, again, is the rate of charge consumption per unit time times energy per unit charge. And so that gives you energy consumption per time. So we would write that as just Looking at the units only, we would say power is equal to charge per unit time, or coulombs per second. We then multiply that by energy per unit charge, which is a joule per coulomb. You know and we carry that out, and the coulombs are going to cancel, and we get joules per second, or the watt. So. Um, the unit of electric power here, and when I multiply amps times volts, results in units of watts. In uh, this formula, often Ohm's law is substituted into this expression, and the power formula for a resistive load connected to a DC voltage source a lot of times is written as P equals I squared R. So we've eliminated the voltage, we've used Ohm's law to do a substitution, P equals I squared R. We call this the power law, it shows that the power increases with increasing voltage or current. However, this relationship is not necessarily true for increases in resistance. In electric power systems, since the voltage is approximately constant, resistance and current are inverse, inversely proportional. Therefore, decreasing the resistance of a load connected to a constant voltage source will uh, also increase current. Since P equals I squared R, power consumption goes up as the square of the current, even though resistance has, uh, has gone down. So uh, let's investigate the implications of I squared R loss, or P equals I times I times R loss, by doing a very simplified DC distribution system example. So we're going to assume that this DC power system has a, a load voltage of 110 volts and is providing power to a city with uh, 200 lamps, each having a resistance of 220 ohms. So there's 200 lamps. Each of them individually is 220 ohms. The power plant is located one kilometer from the city and is connected via 10 gauge solid core copper wire with a resistance per unit length of 3.28 ohms per kilometer. So um, this is a little bit different than resistance as we've talked about it before. We've got some copper wire and what was specified for us was for each kilometer of copper wire that we hook up, it's 3.28 ohms per kilometer. So we're going to investigate uh, how much power is delivered to the load, what the source voltage needs to be, and how much power is uh, radiated as waste heat in the uh, distribution line. So what we want to do is determine the generator voltage necessary to supply the load at the appropriate voltage and determine the ratio of the power delivered to the load to the total delivered by the plant. So we can create this following circuit model here uh, for the power system. We represent the output terminals of the generator, that's this here, is an ideal DC voltage source. So that's what these parallel lines indicate is that is a voltage source and that's a DC voltage source. So you'll sometimes see them as four parallel lines and sometimes you'll just see it simplified as two parallel lines uh, with this um, large line on top and smaller line uh, on the bottom and then that repeated if there's four. Um, so we represent the generator as an ideal voltage source. In this case, we don't know the voltage. We know the load voltage. We don't know the, the source voltage. We are going to represent the total resistance of the distribution system, or that wire, that copper wire that the distribution system is made out of, as a single resistor. We call this a lumped resistance. And then we're going to connect that uh, in series with the generator. So this is the distribution line here, the transmission line. I guess I've called it R sub T. Uh, here. We're going to connect that in series with the generator and uh, we're going to model each of the 200 uh, lamps as a resistor connected in parallel with this 
generator resistor series combination. Since there's 200 lamps though, we're going to represent all 200 of them as a single resistance, as a lumped resistance, using the rules for network reduction for resistors in parallel, resulting in the circuit model shown here. So uh, let's start calculating some of these unknowns. The total resistance of the distribution cable first, R sub T, uh, or the transmission cable, whatever you want to call it. Um, this one's relatively straightforward. All we have to do is multiply the total uh, length of the uh, distribution cable or transmission cable by the resistance per unit length. So that gives us the transmission line resistance. We said that it was 3.28 ohms per kilometer. And we said we had one kilometer of cable. So it's nice when problems are phrased like that. So the total transmission line uh, impedance or resistance, excuse me, is 3.28 ohms. So that cable looks like a 3.28 ohm resistor. Um, now what we have to do is determine the total lumped resistance of the load, right? And we've got 200 of these 220 ohms. So um, the technical formula for resistors in parallel is R E Q. And you should probably remember this from earlier classes, but I'll just write it here for your benefit. It's the summation from over the total number of resistors. We say we start at one and we go to uh, N, where N is the total number of resistors, uh, one over R sub I. Uh, and so if we were to write that out, a little less formally, it would be 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 plus 1 over R4 plus until we get to 1 over R sub N, right? So we're just summing up the inverses or the reciprocals of all of these, uh, of all these resistances. Um, since in our situation all the lamps have the same value, this simplifies to 1 over R E Q. So the equivalent resistance is just equal to the total number of resistors divided by the resistance. And that only holds true if all these values are the same, which they are. And so in this case, we get R E Q, or the equivalent resistance. We'll just flip this. Uh, it was the resistance, which is 220 ohms. And there were 200 lamps. And so that gives us 1.1 ohms. So here we can say RT is 3.28 ohms and uh, R load is 1.1 ohms. So I'm just going to clear the slide real quickly. So now we know these values, um, 3.28. So now we can use those values to figure out uh, what the current draw is and therefore the power sourced by the load. So um, the current drawn by the load is again given by Ohm's law. Uh, the famous Ohm's law of V equals IR is typically how it's written. Right? And so we're going to apply Ohm's law just to this portion of the section, just to the load. We know that the voltage is 110 volts dropped across that DC resistance, 120 volts. Uh, we know what R is, that was 1.1 ohms. And we're left to solve for I. Right? And so that, if we carry that out, I equals 100 amps. Right? So. If we were to draw I on this circuit, there's only one loop, so the current through the load resistor has to be the same as the current through the transmission line, and it is the total current generated or sourced by this one generator. All right, so if we want to know the power of the load, we can say P load equals uh, I times V, uh, so that's 100 amps. And we multiply 100 amps times the 110 volts. And that tells us that the power sourced here is 11 kilowatts. So the power consumed in that resistor is 11 ki uh, 
kilowatts. Because the source voltage is dropped over the series combination of the two equivalent resistances, uh, they each have different voltages across them, uh, but they must have the same current through them uh, by Kirchhoff's current law, right? Um, therefore, we can calculate the voltage drop across this transmission line resistance uh, using Ohm's law again. So this time we're going to do the voltage across the transmission line V uh, RT. It's just the current through the transmission line times its resistance is just going to be I of 100 amps. And we then multiply that by 3.28 ohms. Uh, and that gives us 328 volts. Whoa. 328 volts. Uh, we can calculate uh, the power uh, delivered by this DC voltage and dis dissipated in this transmission line is just going to be 328 volts times 100 amps. So uh, power in the transmission line is just I times the voltage across the transmission line, which is VRT, so it's 328 times 100. And that's going to give us 32.8 kilowatts. So we've calculated the two powers, the power in the load itself, uh, that we want to deliver to electric lighting is 11 kilowatts, and the power dissipated in the transmission line is 32.8 kilowatts, so almost three times as much. So again, I'll clear the slides. So uh, KVL, K Kirchhoff's voltage law, uh, it states that the DC voltage source, the um, it states that the voltage around the closed loop, excuse me, KVL states that the vo voltage around a closed loop must uh, sum to zero. And therefore, the total output voltage from this has to equal the sum of the voltage drops across those two. So uh, from KVL, we can say that the generator voltage, we indicated it as question voltage, um, it's got to be equal to uh, the transmission line, voltage drop across the transmission line plus the voltage drop across, across the load. Uh, so we determined that to be uh, 328 volts and 110 volts. And uh, so that's 438 volts. We'll call that, now we'll call it VG, give it a better name, 438 volts. Volts. So now we know that the voltage sourced by the generator is 438 volts. We can now determine the power delivered uh, by the DC source. There's kind of two ways that we could do this. Uh, method one, I guess, is going to be power from the generator is just the current. Again, remember there's just one current. Uh, I times the uh, generator voltage, so that's uh, 100 amps times uh, 438 volts or uh, 43.8 kilowatts so that's one way to calculate it uh, the second way to calculate it is that um, the the total power dissipated in the loads has to be the total power delivered by the generator so PG has to equal P uh, dissipated in the transmission line plus the power uh, delivered to the load and that was 32.8 kilowatts uh, dissipated in the transmission line plus 11 kilowatts delivered to the load. Again that's 43.8 kilo kilowatts. Uh, so if we look at this real quickly, we look at the fraction of the power delivered to the load. We just take the load power at 11 kilowatts, we divide it by 43.8, and that gives us a quarter, 25%. So only 25% of the power here was actually delivered uh, to the load. The rest of it was radiated as waste heat uh, in the transmission line, which is unfortunate. We, uh, from energy efficiency standpoint, that's, that's not good.